Okay. So I just realized I wasn't sharing my screen that whole time. Somebody should have told me. <laughs> I was, I, I, read, I guess I went through the questions anyway. But anyway, uh, let's do that quiz. Where are we? Not there. All right, we are here. Um, but we're really here, right? So we're really going to be focusing on chapter eight this week, but we have to sort of wrap up chapter six. So like I said, I'll end up posting those answers to that chapter six case study. But if you have a, if you have a question right now and you want to kind of go over it, you can, but we'll go over it on Wednesday. That's not what I meant to do. We will preview the quiz this time. Okay. All right, guys, you all see, and so this was just a kind of really, you know, quick, quick quiz here, I guess. Uh, which brain region listed is, is primarily responsible for energy homeostasis? Hypothalamus. Yeah, hypothalamus. Oh, if you have a question about, as we're kind of going through these, you know, stop and, and ask. And if it's something that I might be like, hey, let me just pull up the slide, uh, I'll do that. But at least let me know kind of if you, where you have a question. Um, all right. Blank is defined as the inability of insulin to achieve its expected biological response. So this is, this is from chapter five, right? Um, what did you, you put here for this one? Insulin. Yeah, insulin resistance, right? So why, what, what's actually happening there? So I guess we can kind of elaborate a little bit on that, right? Because again, we want to understand why insulin can't um, achieve its expected biological response, right? So if we're kind of talking about insulin resistance, what are we, what are we sort of suggesting, I guess, is the problem? If you think about what's happening on the cellular level. The cell doesn't want to um, take any of the, um, I think the glucose from like the insulin because like it has enough. Okay. Um, Kind of, but but why or or I guess okay. So let's go. Let's say it this way. How um, normally, I guess, right? What's insulin's role? What does insulin actually do in terms of in terms of glucose? Right? What what what's its job? Who is that? Um, Rachel. It carries it to storage. Like if there's too much in the blood, then no. Okay. Well, not it brings it to like the cell. So like if there's too much in the blood, then right. like it comes and like removes it from the blood. Um, and right. then like it brings it to a cell to store, no? Not to store, to then break down to use for energy, right? There, okay. there are, there's other hormones, right? That will actually call, um, induce the glucose to be stored, okay? But for, for this, right, when we're talking about insulin, its role, you're right, is to bring it inside the cell, inside cells that want to break it down and use it for energy. Make sense? Right? Um, yeah. So the idea with insulin resistance, I guess, what's the main problem usually with insulin resistance? So is it because there's not enough insulin around? There's no. Fat is to, to regulate its function. Okay, right. So there's enough insulin around, but it's not able, right, to bind to its receptor and bring glucose in. So it's not basically able to complete its job, right? Um, because there's usually um, a down regulation of those receptors or there's something going on in the body that's destroying those receptors or whatever, right? So that's why we call it insulin resistance. It's not that the body's not producing enough insulin. It's that it's just not able to perform the way it's supposed to, right? Okay, so remember to kind of, you know, I think it's important to really sort of understand that, that concept. Any other questions about that? No? Okay, all right. All right, reactive oxygen species, we, we um, I guess, abbreviated them as ROS, right, in the, in the lecture can damage DNA, true or false? Sure. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so where do reactive oxygen species, I guess, come from? 
or we can, or somebody tell me a little bit more about these. I don't know. So any, anything that you sort of learned from the lecture. What do you think? Marianne, what do you think? Just because you're right in my screen here. Sorry. <laughs> what do you think? What else would you say about reactive oxygen species? Aren't they like free radicals or something like that? Yeah. Okay. Good. Marianne, continue on a little bit more there. Oh, I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Try again. Still can't hear you. I don't know why. All right. Sorry, Marianne. <laughs> I can't hear you. Um, go ahead. Somebody else. Somebody else. I actually wanted to ask, where do they come from? Are they just when like through radiation? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple different things that can sort of introduce those, right? Um, yeah, like just any sort of kind of radiation, any sort of like chemical exposure could potentially introduce those. Um, even even kind of just, you know, issues with sort of cell, cell metabolism, right, can kind of lead to these. I mean, it's, it's sort of something that's going to happen um, in the cell, it does, it happens. And just like I said, it's normal metabolic processes. Some of these reactions can sort of give off these reactive oxygen species, right? Because, um, and so the cell actually has a, um, has mechanisms in place, right? To get rid of those reactive oxygen species. That was kind of what I was getting at, right? And what are, and there's also, um, you know, there are antioxidants, right? things like in your diet that you should be taking in that help with that process as well, right? To kind of get rid of these reactive oxygen species. But there are, there are specific enzymes within the cell that can get rid of these, right? Um, so, but there are, a, there are a bunch of reasons as to, or a bunch of things that can induce the sort of the, the production of these reactive oxygen species. Um, so I guess I think I might have listed this specific enzyme. We don't need to worry about that, I guess, right now. But we can kind of go back and talk about this a little bit more. Because I think this was something that was in the recorded lecture, but I didn't necessarily go over this again with you guys. Um, but the idea is, so what's the problem though, right? So if, you're, so if your cells are just, you know, this is related to obesity, right? The idea that you have an increase in these reactive oxygen species. Also in other disease states too, you see this increase in reactive oxygen. And the idea is, yeah, those are kind of can get induced by diet, by chemical exposures and things like that. Um, but also obesity and other types of diseases can decrease the function of these mechanisms that the cell has to get rid of them, right? And so then that will lead to more of them. So like I said, there are normal metabolic processes that will produce these reactive oxygen species as well, okay? Um, but the, the problem, the main problem becomes a sort of dysfunction in that system that normally gets rid of them, right? And then you start to see more and more of these reactive oxygen species um, stay around within the cell and then it can ultimately become toxic to the cell. Um, but also diet is gonna impact that too, right? Because there are um, things that you should be taking in in the diet that will help get rid of these reactive oxygen species, okay? Um, so that's why, you know, really, you know, you talk about obesity um, in terms of in connection with these reactive oxygen species, but you'll see that we'll talk about them again as we talk about some other diseases uh, throughout the semester. Does that answer your can question? That's a long-winded answer. Can you hear me now or no? Yeah, we can. You have anything to add? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, was, I was just trying to say that um, I just felt like if you have an accumulation of reactive oxygen species, just it's not good. That's yes, what I was just correct. trying to say. Perfect. You're right. And that's the idea. The, the idea is that there are always some of these around, right? Um, and, and if there's some of them around, that's okay. But when those levels keep getting higher and higher and, and they start to accumulate within the cell, that's when it becomes dangerous. Okay. And things like diet um, and, and obesity contribute to the production of more of these. Okay. Um, also, like I said, if you have a dysfunction in that mechanism um, or dysfunction in that enzyme that normally helps get rid of them, it's going to make this worse as well, okay? It, who's that? Mariano wrote 
that. Is there one that damages? Is there one that repairs? What do you mean by that, Mariano? <laughs> I mean, as in you said, like, for example, we said this one, reactive damages, damages the DNA. Are there ones that repair it that are, like, no. also, like, reactive oxygen species, like a different species? No. Any, any reactive oxygen species is going to be dangerous to the cell and to, the, and to molecules like DNA and proteins. Does that answer? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it answers it. They're bad in general, right? But like I said, if you, if, you, if you don't have that many of them, your cell can tolerate that and can get rid of them. But when too many of them accumulate, it will lead to more DNA damage or more damage to proteins and therefore then dysfunction of the cell, okay? So it's the idea of kind of this, these levels if they get too high. But they're in general all bad, right? Um, okay, next one. What are fat cells called? This is a quick, hopefully quick one to answer. What's another name for fat cells? Adipocytes. Adipocytes. And what hormone do they produce that we talked about? And you guys had, we had a decent amount of questions about this one hormone. Leptin. Yeah, leptin. Addictive substances increase what in the nucleus accumbens? Dopamine. Yeah, dopamine, right? Remember in that chapter six lecture, I keep constantly coming back to dopamine, right? So the idea is that anything that can potentially be addictive is going to increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, right? It's going to activate those reward centers, okay? So anything that does that is potentially or is considered addictive, okay? Uh, qu more questions about that, guys? All right, which brain region listed below is part of the reward pathway? So I was just kind of talking about that, right? Um, which one here? It starts it kind of, it's kind of where we started from when, we're when I was talking about the reward pathway. BTA. BTA, right. Ventral tegmental area. All right, and then, so the VTA, right, in the VTA is where the dopamine, essentially those neurons are making or producing the dopamine, right? And then that can extend into the accumbens, okay? But that's sort of the, the VTA is sort of the initiator of that, of that reward pathway or one of those specific dopaminergic pathways. Um, all right. So what about this, this question here? What'd you guys put for this one? Alcohol. Okay. Anyone have another answer there? Alcohol. All right. Which substance listed below increases dopamine and norepinephrine and is considered a stimulant, right? So which one of these um, is considered a stimulant and does those, those two things? Amphetamine. Yeah. Good. Amphetamine. And again, remember, in terms of you know, the neurotransmitters that are affected, I'm sure you guys picked this up as you're listening to the recorded lecture, a lot of them affect the same ones, right? Um, so there's a lot of sort of overlap, but in, in the way that they do it or where is going to be, um, is going to affect kind of the overall, um, I guess, sort of, I, I said effect already, <laughs> but where that happens, right, or where dopamine's increased or what have you, is going to then impact what the overall effects are of that drug, okay? So even though there's a lot of overlap in terms of what neurotransmitters are affected, right, you still can have different um, sort of responses because of where kind of thing. So remember that, right? Like, and there's that one picture that kind of shows you different brain regions and things involved. Um, again, like if you're increasing dopamine, say, um, in one area of the brain versus increasing dopamine in, the, in another area of the of the, of the brain, it's going to have two very different effects, right? So the, the effect that something might increase dopamine just in general um, doesn't, doesn't necessarily always tell you kind of what actually is going to be the end result of that, okay? So those are just things to kind of keep in mind when you kind of think about neurobiology, right? 
that there are so many different brain regions that have so many different responsibilities, okay? Um, but there are kind of the same neurotransmitter can be expressed in, in a lot of different brain areas. Um, all right, what do, we, what do we put for this one? False. False. I was so mad at this one. Yeah, that's the one I was- Me too. Answer. What's the answer? True. It's like nexapolone or whatever. Naloxone. No, that's that. <laughs> or Narcan, right? Naloxone or Narcan is, a, is what? Is an antagonist. What does it mean to be an antagonist? Work against. <clears throat> okay, yep. And so in this, in this case, if you're talking about um, a drug that's going to bind to the opioid receptors and act as an antagonist, what does that mean? What's it doing? When it binds to the receptor. It blocks the receptor. Okay, yeah, it blocks Enhancing it. Enhancing it. No, so it's the opposite. So when it blind, bind, an antagonist, when it binds to the receptor, right, it blocks the effect. So it will keep, so think about this, if you're talking about an opiate, you know, an overdose, right? You have the opioid that's binding to its receptors and initiating, you know, that, that sort of inhibitory response on all these target cells, right? But if you then give naloxone or Narcan, it's going to bind to those same receptors and keep the opiate from binding, right? And when that antagonist binds, it's not initiating that response in the cell, right? It's not, it's not causing the inhibition. So essentially all, all it's doing is really blocking those receptors. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So I guess I wasn't trying to trick you, so sorry about that. I guess I kind of did. Um, after repeated use of a drug, more of the drug is needed to achieve the desired effect. What do we call that? Tolerance. Tolerance. Good. Um, when we talk about like psychologic dependence and physical dependence, what's the difference between those two guys? How would you describe the difference, I guess? Physical is like your body demands that you, like you need it. And then psychologic is like, I feel like I need it. Yeah, I think that's a good, I think that's a good distinction. And when you think about physical dependence, that's the idea is like, you can't go and do your normal sort of daily activities without that drug. Right. Um, good. And then what about withdrawal? I mean, what are some, what, I guess, what are some symptoms? Cause this is kind of, you'll see that there were similar symptoms when we talked about withdrawal in sort of general, what are some of the similar symptoms, I guess, that we saw with withdrawal? Um, I'm Remember? assuming that like they get just as like, I mean, they get like sweats and whatnot and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I mean, irritability, right. Things like that. Um, maybe anger there's, so there's a couple kind of like of overlapping, but the idea, obviously super uncomfortable, right. Um, I guess there's more kind of, you can think about more sort of, you know, there's sort of the physiological type sort of withdrawal responses, but then also psychological sort of as well. All right. Well, let's make sure we got them all right. What's this doing? Oh, sorry. Doesn't wants me to click that. Okay. So again, that was just meant to be kind of a quick, sort of straightforward quiz just to get us reviewing the material. Um, questions, more questions about that. All right. So if we now um, take a look at this chapter six lecture quickly. So remember, we're not going to cover chapter seven, okay, guys? I think we all figured that out already, but just a reminder. Ow. Oh, Natasha, do you have another question? No, it was really just that one, how it, like, tricked me. Okay, sorry. I guess that, that maybe that wasn't nice because it kind of sounded like the same name. Um, but remember, it's naloxone or Narcan is the antagonist. Um, naltrexone is actually opposite. Um, okay, so so okay, so I got the chapter six lecture right here. So some questions, I guess, or things that you guys want me to go over a little bit more. One other thing I'm going to do as you think about that, because I was going to do this too. So think about some questions here, and I'm going to pull up the exam to review sheet. 
I actually had a question on the review sheet. Okay, all right, let me pull that up then they can ask um, that. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, for chapter six, towards the end, when you start talking about the associated diseases and comor, uh, I don't know how to say that word. Comor comorbidity. <laughs> what do you mean in specifically? Because I, I remember you talking about it in the like recorded lecture, but okay. I, n I can't really find it on the slides. Okay, I all right, that's a good question. I remember where it was. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, because it's not necessarily listed here. So let me go, let me go to that and then kind of just, yeah. So that was towards the end or of each Yes, one? it was like the last, uh, it was like yeah, towards the right. end of yeah. alcohol use, towards the beginning of tobacco use. Okay. Oh, yeah. You know why? Okay. So, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. So I did add that in, in terms of some extra here you're talking about, like this slide. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I probably want to add that to the review sheet. Um, so I originally, I guess, didn't have as much detail on this slide, but I thought it was um, important for us to kind of go through this. So I guess what I want you guys to know from this, so again, what this is really specifically talking about, right, is really heavy use, heavy chronic use of alcohol, right? So many years, um, and so what are some of the effects of, of that, right? And some of these sort of associated diseases. So yeah, so the first one kind of first category there, I have written chronic malnutrition and liver effects. Um, and so I guess the take home message here is that we wanna understand that chronic use of alcohol can lead to diseases of the liver, right? Um, and so one of the ones that I listed here was cirrhosis. Um, you guys have probably heard of that before, okay? Um, so I, so I really, that's kind of what I want you to understand, right? So if you're going to think about some, uh, an organ that was particularly affected by chronic heavy alcohol use, definitely liver, right? Um, and so, and this is kind of just giving you a little bit of background as to why, why that happens, okay? Um, questions about that? No, and then the right. very next one that says examples of drugs that fit into each category, should we just uh, uh, mention like nicotine, cannabis, uh, like a certain opioid and a certain yeah. substance? Yeah, are you talking about on the review sheet? You're going back to the review yeah, sheet? It's, yeah, yeah, it's the very last one Yeah. on chapter six. Correct, that's what I mean. So like if we're talking about like a stimulant, give me an example of a stimulant, right? What's an example of a stimulant? couple, right? You want to know those, those examples that basically I gave, right? We should know, we, we should know that cocaine, right? Is a stimulant. Do you know what I mean? I want you to okay. know, you know that that's the idea, right? So, so I guess actually that only applies to a couple of what we talked about, really the stimulants, the host, yeah. right? The, Cause the other ones, obviously alcohol is just alcohol, right? Cannabis is just cannabis or whatever. So, so it only applies to those um, here, I'll tell you right now what it applies to, right? Where are we? Not Yeah, so, right? So stimulant, hallucinogens, and opiates. You're right, exactly. So an example of um, an opioid drug, right? So what's an example of an opioid? Or a couple examples you guys can give me? Morphine. Yep, morphine. What else? What's another one? Heroin. Mm -hmm. Heroin. I think I also mentioned a synthetic one. Um, begins with an F. You guys remember that one? Fentanyl. Yeah, fentanyl. Fentanyl is, is nasty, nasty stuff. Um, and it's, but it's out there. Uh, definitely contributes to probably uh, more um, overdoses than some of these other um, opiates. I mean, heroin as well. But some people take, you know, fentanyl in combination with with other stuff, and that's that's really bad news um, because it's super, super potent. Uh, what about, yeah, so I gave stimulant, right? Cocaine, what's another example of a stimulant? Was on our quiz. Another example of a stimulant? Amphetamine. Yeah, amphetamine. Good. You know, amphetamine, methamphetamine. Um, 
I think I also talked about some other uh, like synthetic, where are we? Let me just pull those up. Right, these synthetic cathinones. Um, yeah, I guess that's pretty much those were the examples we gave. We didn't give, I didn't give them any more. Um, and then for hallucinogens, right, there's some examples here. So, I mean, again, just probably, you probably don't need to know every single example. Um, and it probably would be more of, I don't know, I mean, I guess if I asked you to give an example, I would say, hey, list two examples. But I guess the other way around, I would want you guys to know, right? So, like, if I, if I said, is LSD a stimulant? you know, a hallucinogen or whatever, I would want you guys to be able to put it in the right category. Okay, does that make sense? So it's more kind of going that way, rather than saying list every single, you know, example of a hallucinogen that I gave. It wouldn't be like that. If I asked you to list that way, I would say, hey, list, you know, two examples or something like that. So you would sort of have the freedom to choose the two that you kind of, you know, remembered. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Okay, so, um, you know, that was the other thing. So, you know, the review sheet isn't that detailed, again, on purpose, because we should be adding our notes in there. So I think at some point I reminded you guys during that recorded lecture, but I'll remind you again, make sure you're writing your notes in your review sheet. So really, you know, your review sheet should have a lot of notes on it for chapter five and chapter six, right? And you should just kind of be waiting for the notes on, on chapter eight, okay? Um, other questions on chapter six or anything, we're just about out of time, but anything else you want me to go over? So um i just wanted to quickly ask about um the comorbidities for tobacco uh disorders mm -hmm. you specifically started talking about how psych like there's a almost 90 percent of psychiatric yeah. patients use um cigarettes to self-medicate right i how would you like which is the comorbidity like the their mental illness the and, yeah, I mean, I guess here the comorbidity is psychiatric illness and smoking, right? It's those two things together. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and I did say too, um, for like, for like COPD, I'm not, we're not responsible for knowing the details of COPD or the symptoms or anything like that. We do that when we talk about respiratory disorders, right? But we want to know that obviously smoking is associated with COPD, right? And also with cardiovascular disorders. If we think about cancers, we're going to think about lung cancer, but other cancers as well. But yeah, for that question about the psychiatric conditions, the comorbidity is smoking and psychiatric conditions. It's just the idea that those, that often you'll see them together. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of like the same thing if you use comorbidity like say with traumatic brain injury often there's a comorbidity of chronic pain with traumatic brain injury it just means that you see them together um i guess more often than not or there's a high percentage of patients where you see both okay other questions guys no all right then um, we're done for today. So again, if you haven't listened to this recorded lecture, please do and take your notes um, on that review sheet. I will be putting up chapter eight, but you know, on, on Wednesday, we'll go over the chapter six case study. And please, if you have more questions or other things that you want me to clarify more on chapter six, I wanna make sure that I go over everything that you guys need me to go over, okay? Um, and then by that time, chapter eight will already be up. Um, and if, again, if we feel like, you know, depending on how many questions there are and how far we kind of get with chapter eight, I may move the exam from Monday to Wednesday next week or something like that. Okay, so I'll, I'll let you guys know about that. But the chapter eight case study, um, you know, I extended it till Friday. Um, you know, if we, you guys kind of feel like you need more time on that. All right. So the if you have other, other questions, just stay on. Okay, guys, I'll stay on. The review sheets still do um, on Wednesday, right? Well, that's the other thing too. I guess. Um, I guess that's sort of also dependent on, I may also, um, do we, are, are we feeling like we're gonna definitely need more time with chapter eight? I'm sensing that the answer is yes on that. If you notice, yeah, it just seems there's a lot. Long. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot and I think um, it's a lot of stuff that we haven't talked about yet, okay? Um, so I will, so the chapter eight case study, so, so almost like I'm gonna push back the exam. Now, I may, for the exam, 
I may also, I told you guys, I'm going to give you a little more time. I will do that. But I also may say, Hey guys, you know, you have from, you know, on Wednesday from say nine o'clock to five o'clock to do it on your own. I may do that. Okay. So just kind of a heads up on that rather than everyone logging in and doing it all at once. We may kind of try that out and see how that goes. Um, but so I'll definitely give you guys at least till Wednesday. So let's push the chapter eight case study and the um, review sheet to Monday. How does that sound? So a week from today. That works yeah. for me at least. Because again, just be you know forewarned that the review sheet, you know, just as it looks, is there's a lot going on in chapter eight. There is. Okay. All right. I'll change those due dates for you. Okay, guys. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Let me know. Professor, we don't do chapter seven. No, we're skipping chapter seven. No chapter seven. Just five, six, and chapter eight. Thank you. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. You too. Bye, guys. Let me fin let me stop recording too.